This is Viewpoint's collaborative show. It's called Reaching Out. A small group of artists have reached out into their community to someone they identify with and the art you see is a result of that collaboration. It may be a family member, someone that they know personally, or someone in the community, and the art is as unique as that collaboration. I was on Ancestry.com in between art projects and I came across a ship manifest of my grandfather in 1929 and it all of a sudden our family story became really real to me when I saw his name listed um, and the ship that he was on and how he came to Honolulu Harbor on July 4th on Independence Day and I was absolutely intrigued by that. I wanted to find out more. My uncle Gene and I are close, so I wanted to find out more about our family. The manuscripts that she discovered uh, just presented the facts of uh, my great-grandparents who immigrated. It was a hard film. Oh, and just looking over the manuscripts and the facts of their arrival, the dates, um, you could uh, immediately ascertain, have a glimpse of the of what they were going through when they first arrived here. For the Filipinos, and I imagine the other immigrants too, it really was an opportunity. Like my dad, <clears throat> in fourth grade, saw the American flag and uh, saw how beautiful it was. And, uh, and he made it a goal to uh, come to America. 1929, in fact, uh, it was 4th of July. And it was, uh, special because uh, when he, the ship arrived in Honolulu Harbor, boy, the fireworks were on display. And we, you know, our, our family tradition, we go and visit uh, our, um, our grandparents, all the parents, uh, grave sites every year, and also on my wife's side, her grandparents, and uh, we truly believe in keeping a link with, by keeping our children linked up to the past, that they understand where they came from and where they are going through. I'm now into writing and I really appreciate this kind of uh, artistic uh, work here. I mean, I, I really can identify with this. This piece is entitled The Last Harvest. It coincides with literally the last harvest here on Maui of December of 2016. The imagery, however, is old. It comes from, um, I believe, a 1930s photograph of a plantation on Kauai, which we found out after the painting was completed was the first plantation my grandfather, my Uncle Gene's father, Teodulo, he worked at. So I like to think that maybe one of these workers might be my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, image is oil on linen. And I'm using a couple of different uh, techniques. So the image itself is um, high contrast red going into, of course, like the magenta and lavender tones. When, and when you get up close, it works on two levels in terms of scale. When you get up close, it looks like a very abstracted image. It's difficult to make out the figures when you're as close as I am. But when you walk to the back of the room, it's pretty clear like a black and white photo of um, a newspaper photo, for example, that they are images of cane workers in the field laboring, presumably with all kinds of tools. It wasn't mechanized at that time. They were probably filling up trucks and then taking the harvested cane into the factory to then make raw cane sugar that we all know as the end product. Um, the pattern in the background is a damask print that is a reference to the Filipino Barang Tagalog shirt that my grandfather used to wear. I wanted to reference um, the beauty, the visual um, aesthetic of that garment sort of going all the way up into the sky, which if you look closely, it starts out with a titanium white and actually slowly there's a gradation of all the way to blue. So there's a slight color shift in this pattern in the background. Um, the 
the medium I'm using up here in the front to create this real high gloss shine is a, um, is a medium that was invented by Peter Paul Rubens. It's a very old fashioned material that allows for this real high intensity color transmission and it's made of fancy exotic ingredients like Venetian turpentine and things that take forever to dry. <laughs> so each layer, there's probably about 10 layers of, of red for example here, is built upon the next layer and then that depth of color is transmitted with this high gloss intensity. I need the cultural references that I am trying to discover. So I, I looked and I, I thought, oh well purple and pink and, and, and those colors are important in the Filipino palette when I started looking at contemporary art in the Philippines and also the references to traditional art. So I decided to incorporate those um, for aesthetic purposes, but then as I was creating it, I realized there was also um, a conceptual idea in that you've got the red heat of the cane field contrasting with sort of this ethereal um, purple lavender up at the top. And I, I think for me it was sort of a process of relating to what they may have felt initially upon their arrival, which was this was very hard labor, difficult, red hot work. And eventually, you know, they had their cultural expressions that, that, were, um, that were always there, despite the fact that they were field laborers. And then as they, you know, um, gained their independence and owned their own homes and had their own businesses, then they, they, you know, it transmitted or transformed, I should say, into something else more, um, not of this earth, not so direct in the fields and, um, you know, with the parties that they had, with the music that they played, with their incredible rich tradition. So I wanted to try to express that with this gradation, um, you know, to, to, to not just have it be about the red hot hard labor that we all know so many people engaged in, but that there was something um, that was incredibly refined and incredibly dignified and incredibly beautiful um, amidst this hardship. What they had to endure to come here and also turn into going from field laborers to business owners to property owners and to um, become what this country really represents. It's such an important narrative, I feel, especially with the immigrant um, situation being as politically divided as it is, we have to really bring these stories to light about we are a country of immigrants. We have these incredible traditions. We have, uh, every, every family has a story, so it's important to connect with that story and, and bring it to bear for ourselves, for our family, to pass that on because we're not going to be here and they may not ever know who they came from unless we pull it together now. Uh, this, this kind of endeavor, um, it really captures basically the human spirit and, and the history of it uh, in, in microcosmic, you know, in a small way. Yeah, thank you. Gladys and I have become friends over uh, the past couple of years and uh, I knew that she had some background with the sugar industry but I didn't know how much and uh, I thought it would be nice for someone who's a politician among other things to to be involved with something creative uh, and I thought it was an opportunity for maybe her to tell a bit of her story with the sugar industry which is you know, wrapping up its life here in Hawaii. Of course, I'm a girl from Makawao. This has been my home for most of my life, as well as my husband. So this is, um, I'm comfortable here. And I'm excited to see that the old theater is this beautiful gallery. Spend many afternoons here at mm -hmm. the matinee. Our parents mm -hmm. would give us a dime and we'd get to go to the matinee, which mm -hmm. is really wonderful. I became an elected official you <clears throat> 10 years ago when I was asked to run for the upcountry seat on the council. After I completed my work at MEO, I retired. And as I was going out the door, somebody mm -hmm. said, I really think you ought to consider elected office. And I said, oh my God, I hadn't thought of that. But I did, and it's been a great 10 years. I had lunch with Michael and his wife, and we had enjoyed a nice lunch. 
And then he says, I have an idea. <laughs> and I said, me, art? I said, you know, I appreciate art. I love it. And I like looking at it. And uh, I'm real comfortable, but I don't know anything about how you do it. I can't even draw a stick man. And he said, not to worry. I'll help you. And that's when he gave me the blank canvases and the paints. And it all began. My idea was to not put any parameters on Gladys to just let her have fun painting these eight by eight squares. And I said, don't worry about anything representational. Um, do whatever you like, but just have fun. Gladys sent me a, a nice brief history of her family's connection to the sugar industry. And some of that's incorporated into this. I told her uh, I had a couple of sketches of ideas of the composition incorporating some of those components that were in her story. She had no idea what I was going to do with, with the paintings. And I had no idea what I was going to paint. And it was very challenging when he said, no parameters. He said, paint whatever you want to do. You know, if you want to paint a square, a square all red, do that. You want to paint circles, do that. You want to paint a cat, do it. You want to paint a flower, do it. And so with that wide open field, it was a big challenge to try to figure out, well, what do I put on these squares? And it got to the point where um, I was, it was becoming a challenge. And Michael had also told me that if I needed some help, that I could ask my grandkids or I could ask a friend or anybody I wanted to help me. Well, lucky enough at work, I have a friend, her name is Kit Zulueta. And so I talked to her and I said, Kit, you think you can help me do a few of these? And so I have another partner. And so we got it all done. And then I called Michael and said, we're done. And I had no clue. I couldn't for the life of me envision how he was going to come up with that. It's definitely a departure from my usual work, which is much more representational. Yes. You know, there's some sadness mixed in with uh, the closing of the sugar industry, but um, I think it was a vibrant, lively time, and I wanted to make it a kind of a vibrant, lively, colorful piece. And she certainly did that <laughs> by just, uh, you well, know, gr giving me these beautiful pieces to work with. You know, I cannot believe that he was so clever. And I think the picture that I really wish we could share is the picture of him with all the pieces cut, cut apart. It's mm -hmm. unbelievable. For anybody who's quilted, you can get that idea, a crazy quilt where you don't have a pattern, but you just have pieces. My mom used to do crazy quilts. And the fact that he was able to figure out what to do with all of that is just amazing. And things like this five, my grandfather drove the locomotive for the plantation, and his locomotive was number five. And he managed to get that in there. It, it's just incredible, the imagination. Well, there was a point where I, I really I thought, what the hell did I get myself into? <laughs> well, yeah, it was a challenge to not only to cut the pieces put in, but also look for things that would work and go together. And I had this idea of making this train red. One of these paintings uh, that Gladys did is an octopus. So all of this is down in here was her octopus painting. Overall, the, the scene is, you know, not, not of any specific mill, but just general, um, you know, mill buildings and those type of things. You know, most of the paintings that we see now, are kind of depressing to look at. Mm -hmm. The colors are dark. Uh, everything looks like it's closed. There's no life. Total opposite. Well, yeah, for me, I've painted the mill many times yeah. in many different uh, light. And, you know, there's no doubt that, yeah. you know, it, it, it's the structure itself is in decline. Yeah. It's not a newly painted building, all those kind of things. From a realistic standpoint, I capture those. I, I like that. Yeah. But for this painting, I wanted to add some, add some life to it. You know, it was a. I wasn't born and raised here, so you know I don't, and will never have that connection to sugar and, and its role in uh, in Hawaii. 
but um, I know so many people that are, were, uh, that was a part of their life, and they have really deep, sensitive feelings about it. So hopefully, you know, even though it's closing, we can still celebrate what it was. Yes, yes. It'll live forever. No, I just want to say that I really am grateful to Michael for proposing this. I would have never thought of it, and I'm deeply honored that somebody of his talent and skills was willing to work with me on something, and I'm so proud of the result. <laughs> Well, as you know, I really love painting landscape, and I love big, expansive landscapes. And um, so I was aware of the Hawaiian Islands Land Trust and their properties, and I've known Scott <laughs> since he was very young. Always. <laughs> and so I, I called him as a resource and asked him if he could show me something that the public really wasn't aware of and didn't have access to. And so he suggested new. And I mean, that's an area everybody hardly gets to. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was really excited about that. So I've gone out there twice with him and he's explained the, the properties. And the bonus was, I mean, I knew it looked like this, the, the Haleakala Rim and the arid lands. I didn't know about all of this. And then he explained um, the sites, the home sites, and the petroglyphs, and that was something I didn't know about. Well, it's, it's a great opportunity to work with. I mean, I've known Betty Hay, as, as she uh, noted. I've known her my whole life, and we've always just loved her artwork. And so uh, my house was filled with, uh, when growing up, my house was filled with her, her art. And even today, we, I have a number of, uh, of her paintings in my home and so when she called me up it was just a great opportunity uh, to showcase what the lands that we work on love and we want to share that with everybody we want to we want to make sure that everybody is aware of the fact that these lands are while they're owned by a, a private nonprofit that they are available to everyone and then telling the story of those lands can come through a very you know variety of mediums for example through narrative, through storytelling, but more importantly through artistic rendition. It's in the Kaupo district, so that the arid areas of Maui, um, the arid lands of Maui are, you know, parts of Honua'ula, Kahiki Nui, and Kaupo. Kaupo is on the on the uh, western side of Kaupo is the Ahupua of, of Nu'u. So it's a, it's a fairly dry land, um, but people thrive there. And so uh, what made the Hawaiian Islands Land Trust, uh, Hawaiian Islands Land Trust interested in this land is the fact that uh, it has the healthiest coastal uh, spring-fed wetlands in the state. Most of the native, ve most of the vegetation in the pond is native, and so that attracted us to the property. In addition to that, it's really high-quality habitat for a number of endangered species. A third factor that really attracted the Hawaiian Islands Land Trust to this particular property is the fact that it links Maui and the Big Island. These birds can. Um, the endangered species fly back and forth between Maui and the Big Island, and between. Um, Maui, Maui's wetlands. So from a biological perspective or an e ecological perspective, that's what attracted us most. But also this is a rich area. We know that people have been living here since about 1500 and they've left their mark all over the landscape. And telling that story is vital to actually reconnecting us to our kupuna, to our past. And if we don't do that, then we forget why things are important. And so there are ki'ipohaku or petroglyphs. Um, all over the property. We've counted nearly a hundred um, and new ones are being uncovered periodically and so there's probably over a hundred. There's a number of house sites or kauhale or uh, a village site. Um, there's ritual sites or heiau. Uh, we've identified just a whole spectrum, you know, fishing, fishing areas. Uh, it's a, still a pop to this day, it's a popular fishing area. So really just has this uh, rich saturation of important features and to express that artistically is extremely valuable because it gets people engaged and that's what we want. We want to bring people on the land. Not everybody can go out to Kaupo, whether they live on Maui or not, or maybe they just don't have the capacity to make it out there, but through this artwork they can actually 
experience it to some degree and that is extremely important to us we you know people protect and care for what they love and what they love is what they know and the more they know it the more they're going to love it if i could say when he was talking about the the lava and everything for instance this is the remnants of a house site um, and the formations of lava as i said i grew up on the big island so i seen lava forever but I've never seen lava flows like stop and have these big vertical blocks and things that look like they're shaped into squares and rectangles where they lived and then when you come in here which is this blow up you find the petroglyphs and um, you know they tell the stories and this this one over here is one that looks like the Birdman of Rapa Nui mm -hmm. And I really don't understand how and when they came, and is this a different date of migration? Yeah, it, we, we just don't know. There's, there's so much more to be explored. Yeah, I think you walk past all of this, and then you walk around, and you get to this pond. And standing there, I thought, I, I don't understand. You know, hundreds of thousands of people eventually lived here. And it looks so arid, and it looks mm. so harsh. It's beautiful. It's magnet, but but how hard is this to live here? Um, that they chose to live here. I kept thinking they didn't get in their canoes and go over to West Maui. That was green and easy to live in. They chose to live here. Yeah, the history of the land, as I mentioned, about 1500 is when people arrived. Um, we think people arrived in the Kaupo district about 1500. And what I like to tell people is that you know, in in the in the well watered valleys. What, what was traditionally known as the Aina Mamona, the, the abundant, the rich lands, the sweet lands. Uh, you know, people could live. You could, li you could make your lo'ikalo, your taro patches. But in areas like Kaupo, um, particularly after about 1200, when sweet potato came from southern Polynesia, uh, that's when people could explore, in, could move into these drier lands. And that really opened up a whole another facet of life. And on, on the Big Island in particular, you have these massive field systems. Well, now we're realizing there are massive field systems uh, such as in Kaupo, and this is sort of the edge of that field system, that dry land field system that they uh, were supported through uh, rainfall as opposed to streams that fed, that fed the, uh, the taro patches. So it was, you really had to know what you were doing because Hawaii is subject to droughts. As we all know, periodically we, we do face droughts. People living here had to really, really know what they were doing. And the other thing that's really important to remember is that they had to maintain very close relationships so that if a drought hit, you could, you could, you could get your food from your family members who lived on the wetter side or who maybe were not subject to droughts. Or you could know how to go fishing and, and, and extract, extract resources from the ocean. What I think is captured so well is that um, nu'u literally means the heights. So, the heights, and, and that's just so beautifully captured here. You see the, the waterfall, which periodically does flow. It's also a signal for us to get moving because that water coming down is a, uh, a danger. We need to get moving in because of the flash floods. And so when we see that flowing, we're, we're, that's the end of our work. It's, it's interesting that it's, it's so expansive. Yeah. You drive out there, you leave you know, busy Maui, and then you get out into this empty land, and you can just feel this and enjoy it and um, I've been out there several times where you know this can be really clear it can be covered in clouds or it can be clear and have a cloud across here creating you know wonderful shadows I mean it's it's really quite wonderful and you're there pretty much by yourself so it's amazing you come through all this environmental interest very yeah, naturally yeah. because your dad did that's right yeah. and I think when I first started painting, he was one of the first people that said to me, come, come out here. Oh, and yeah. we went out on a dirt road in the cane fields, and he said, look at the light over there in the mountains. And I thought, nobody has ever said this to me before. Yeah. So, I mean, he loved oh, the land. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's definitely where um, I, I feel as though I get it. And of course, my parents have passed on, but you know, carrying on their legacy is really important. And now I have my own kids to make sure that I uh, convey that to them as well. I've yet to be invited to Kaho'olawe, but I'm hoping someday that I might be able to set foot on the island because it definitely has my heart, as does this guy here. Um, 
thank you. I want to thank you personally for all that you do for Maui. You basically stepped off the plane and got involved. And I've seen some of the photos that Brian has taken on the island of Kaha'olawe, and the debris cleanup alone must have been a huge, huge project. KIRC is Kirk is uh, Ko'olawe Island Reserve Commission. And it was started in, um, I think it was 1990, when um, Ko'olawe was given back to the, island, uh, to the state of Hawaii. Uh, so the Kirk is basically responsible for clearing areas in which people can go and try to restore vegetation on the island. Um, so that's what some of the pictures are of, you know, that Carmen has done. I've always wanted to go, and I've had the chance to go over seven times. And so I'm living vicariously through Brian, because <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted to go to Kaha'olawe. I remember when I first moved here, you could hear the bombing uh -oh. on Kaha'olawe, and it was tragic. I mean, I just had this, this connection to, to those uh, issues and thinking, you know, I'll bet you that island has some historical, cultural uh, significance. And what a tragedy that in this day and age, and of course I moved here in 1981, they're bombing an island for target practice? What is up with that? So anyway, when I um, found out that Brian was involved with the Kaho'olawe Island Reserve Commission, that just really turned me on. And so then the next step was I heard that Brian was going over and had the opportunity to take some photographs that uh, we could possibly depict the um, culture, the um, tradition, and the restoration of Kaho'olawe. When you go to the cultural sites that are, some of them are still preserved, you know, you just kind of get chicken skin. So it's, it's a... Petroglyphs. It's a, petroglyphs, yeah, it's a, it's a special place. So it should be protected, it should be preserved and restored if, if we possibly can help and What really it. excited me was um, when Brian and I first met and talked about this, was how Hawaiian is being brought back to Kaho'olawe. And um, we were able to talk about the rain shrine. We were able to talk about base camp and the fact that they actually do uh, imu. Because of the cutback a few years ago, um, they had to lay off a bunch of employees from Kirk. Uh, a lot of people had to take um, cuts in pay and the people that were living on the island, they had to leave the island because they couldn't pay for them to be there that often. And didn't they used to have boatloads of people they would bring in um, from all over Hawaii, like several people that would come in and work on the island? Well, when they were doing the cleanup of the island of like removing the unexploded ordnance, I think it was something like there was 400 people mm -hmm. a day on the island. A day. Yeah, so out, out of that 400, I think there was something like 350 of them were being brought in on a daily basis. And then there was only, I think, maybe 40 or 50. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but, um, and those people were living in like a base camp um, situation, which was an old military um, compound. Personally, I think, and this is part of what we hope to uh, achieve with um, our um, project, our collaboration, is to foster awareness of what's happening on the island and the importance of the people of Maui. Uh, it's Kaho'olawe is part of Maui County, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> but, um, you know, taking this under our wing for posterity because. Um, the ancient Hawaiians definitely found something important about this island, and I think we need to revisit that and, um, you know, get people interested and involved so that we can protect, preserve, and become even more aware of um, the cultural and historical significance for today and tomorrow, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Again, when I have gone over, it's, you know, I've taken photographs just for my personal enjoyment, but again since i know <clears throat> so many people that never get the opportunity to go i've taken them to share with them so that's what i i shared with carmen so that's what she's turned into these beautiful paintings 
So these are of uh, Lua Makika, which is the crater on Ko'olawe. And here they're replanting or planting sweet potato, which was a canoe garden food that was brought over from Tahiti. And here is the, the emu that uh, they're preparing. And then on the opposite wall is the, the water shrine that uh, was built by the Native Hawaiians back in the, I think it was the 80s. So that's like a, a spiritual point in, for them. Basically, the collaborative part was talking about Ko'olawe, uh, what it meant to me, or what it means to me, sharing the pictures with Carmen, um, explaining what's going on in the different photographs, and basically me telling the first our first meeting so brian get some close-ups <laughs> <laughs> this is what i would like to see after we discuss yeah you know, because like, most of the time when i take pictures it's like well i'm not really interested in what they're doing it's just to, to show the overall um and a lot of times in my own personal photography i think people distract from the natural beauty. So I usually go to places and wait till people leave to take pictures. So after talking to Carmen, she's like, no, I need the people. I, need to, people. I need to see what they're doing. And it's like, okay. So <laughs> my hope for the result of this exhibit of these paintings is to raise awareness of what's going on on Ko'olawe um, for them to take an interest, um, find out what's been going on, um, if they have a desire to possibly volunteer to contact Kirk, um, try to get onto their volunteer list, um, or even make a donation. And I'm pretty much in the same boat, or wish I was, um, <laughs> to call a lot of it. <laughs> Hint, hint, hint. <laughs> um, but seriously, I feel the same way. And I would also like to mention that there are a couple of really good videos about Kaho Olave on YouTube and also on the Kirk site, the Kaho Olave Island Reserve Commission. And they do have a really good video that tells about the history, the culture, and hopefully about the future of, of the island as part of the county of Maui. A couple of years ago, we uh, had a session here uh, with Timmy, and he explained to us about the Haamoku system. And um, when he was talking about it, I uh, actually started to visualize the system in my mind. It just gave me the idea. I thought, oh, wow, that would be a beautiful painting. And I, and I was thinking, I think I could do it. My first approach was to talk to his mother, Gordon Bele, who is my kumu as well. And she helped me in the process of getting us together and communicate to do the piece. And I'm uh, born and raised here, on the island of Maui in the Moku of Kula, the Ahupua'a of Alai. Uh, born and raised as a farmer. And I've been uh, involved with the Ahamoku system ever since I was turned on to it by the late John Kaimikawa, who was a kumuhula in Molokai. And he had shared the prophecy at a, a Western Pacific Fisheries Management Council meeting. And when I was asked to give a talk here at the Viewpoints Gallery for Joelle, she got inspired and, and um, off of my presentation and her, through her vision and us working together, um, it, it really just explains the process of people management, really, um, in the ancient times. Because the Ahamoku system was based on the Ahakioli, the baby fish. When our kahuna and our uh, spiritual leaders looked into the ocean and saw that this abundance of baby fish in the muliwai and the mixing of the fresh water and ocean water, they looked on the land and saw that our people were almost as abundant as this fish. And there was no system of management. So it was just basically chaotic. And they decided to gather the experts, which is the aha, or also represents a cordage. 
in a certain cordage. So to explain that cordage, as it was explained to me by uh, the late John Kai Mikawa, everybody's an expert. So if you're a fisherman or a farmer or a medicinal, la'a, lapa'au, any of these people that had the knowledge would come together at a council meeting and present like an aho, a cord. And when you got these experts and you wove it together in a certain fashion, those experts decided to create the Ahamoku system, which basically divided our land, our oceans, our sky, our lani, everything into a managed system. And for example, on the island of Maui, we have 12 moku, hence the Aha and then the moku land divisions. And they decided to divide the Aha moku into 12 on Maui primarily because the resources in each moku was common. There was always something to do with the ocean. There was always something to do with the vai, the water. There was always something to do with the lani, the sky, the air, and then the aina. And then of course, the burials of our kupuna. So when they divided these 12 moku up, they made sure that all four of those commonalities or five of those commonalities were present in each moku. And the 12 that we have on Maui, nine of them are on the East Maui end, and three of them are on the West Maui end, which gives us 12. But what's really interesting about the Aha Moku on Maui, which is different than a lot of the other islands' moku system, is that Maui represents kind of a woman's body with the head and the body of a, of a person. Primarily the women, because the women are the ones that determine the bloodline, determine the reproductive stages, all these things. So long story short, with West Maui being the head, with the Pu'ukukui being the center of those three moku there, Ka'anapali, uh, Lahaina, and Pu'ali Komohana, known as Wailuku. And then on this end, east end, we have the belly button, or the pico, known as Pohaku Palaha, up at Haleakala, and it houses eight out of the nine moku. And the nine moku on the east end are Hamaku Apoko, Hamaku Aloa, Ko'olau, Hana, Kipuhulu, Kaupo, Kahiki Nui, Honua Ula, and then the biggest one known as Kula. So basically the system was a way of managing our people based on the natural resources because the natural resources had to be a priority in order for us to live. Based on that information, I started to do my own research. It's not written anywhere, anywhere and it's actually a knowledge that's getting lost. So of course it made me want to do it even more. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little bit uh, concerned and I had questioning to myself, or am I supposed to do this, you know, not being Hawaiian. So I ask, which I do once in a while, I ask for a sign, <laughs> if, am I supposed to do this? And, uh, and on the same day I had two events. One of them was to meet by chance with one of my Hawaiian friends, David Heva Heva, who gave me some information that clarified some of the questions I had. But the main sign was that I had a dream, and the dream <laughs> was that, um, did I told you this, right? Uh, it was that I was in, a, in a, maybe a train station or airport, you know, and, and I, uh, I was waiting online and a guard came to me and asked for my papers and he asked me, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to the Aamoku system. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, okay, you can go. <laughs> so that was a sign for me that maybe I was supposed to do this and I shared it with Timmy, who immediately responded and said, okay, let's really try to find a time together. And uh, we did, and I was very encouraged by the fact that when I presented to him my sketches, right away he responded uh, very well to it. When she brought the sketch out and I saw the sketch, I was immediately floored and impressed that the message I was sharing was absorbed. 
And when I saw that in her design, I was immediately impressed and said, yeah, well, I think we got it covered. And then we kept working on some fine details, including the, the colors involved to make the natural colors of the, the world as we see it through our eyes. Um, how we as native people are natural or nature in itself. A lot of times in today's world, we forget that we're nature and we were nature. Um, but native cultures worldwide respond to that because our language, our songs, our dance, our culture is based on natural resources. So it's the pohaku, the rocks that give us the ability to carve our pohaku ki'i, to tell the stories of our generations that we come from. Um, the game of papakonani that we play, to mindset of our strategy, the natural fibers to make the aha, um, everything was just kind of depicted in her sketch and we just went more and more from there. And I was happy that I made the choice of depicting uh, Timmy because I felt when I was doing the painting, it was kind of a meeting place between the Hawaiian culture and Timmy embodying that culture. And, and uh, you know, he explained to me about his tattoos and, and I could actually include them into the system. But what's really interesting is the Native Hawaiian tattoo designs, and I gotta credit my kakao kani, or tattoo man, Samson Harp. He and I had a big connection from day one when we met, but this pattern right here represents the nene, and it's not the nene walking, it's the nene's flight pattern. If you ever watch geese fly, they fly in a triangular pattern. And that's what it represents. And the fact that I chose a nene pattern is because like the nene, they could fly and go somewhere else. But as a kanaka, I choose to be here just like the nene. But when I saw her sketch and see how it's proportioned like this, you can look at them in quadrants. So you can look at these four, these four, those four, and that four as a quadrant. And you can look at this as a center and this being a cross. Well, you have the representation of our four major gods. We have Kanaloa depicted of the ocean and the mana, and everything from the Aikai, which is where the food source is on the shoreline, to the Lipo, to where the voyaging and, and the depths of the ocean are. And as you go up to the next quadrant, <coughs> you have the waters of Kani. So Kani also represents the west side, so you have Kanaloa, you have Kani, the waters of Kani, and then we move over to Ku, and you actually have Kualono. So you have Ku, Lono, Kanaloa, and Kani, the four gods, and it's in a quadrant. And that also depicts um, the Ahamoku system in itself. So each one of these gods have uh, certain powers or certain uh, roles. As Kanaka today and the Kulianos we have today, we have to put something higher than ourselves. And if we can't put nature higher than ourselves, then we have to look at other, other ways. So we have spiritual ways of being, of having something higher than ourselves. But not everybody believes in the same spiritual things. Uh, for some of us, especially our men, our Hawaiian men in today, we need to put like our wives and our children a high, higher than ourselves too. But when it comes to nature and amongst everybody, nature has to be at its highest. And that's what the Ahamoku system was created because if we had chaos and we didn't have balance and we didn't have management and we didn't have these experts who made canoes telling you what trees to cut and what not to cut and when to cut, when we didn't have fishermen that tells you when to fish and you can fish and put restrictions, when we didn't have abundance of water coming through the lo'i and what other did you, when you didn't have that management concept of nature, because nature cannot be reproduced by man, I think that this work that Joel has done has captured the Ahamoku system and the meaning behind it, that it's all about the resources that we can't duplicate. And it's the connection of spirituality and then the fact that we as Kanaka people are able to use these natural resources to provide what we need spiritually, what we need as tools, and what we need as food. So I think it depicts the Ahamoku system well. I think one thing that's really important is no matter what Kanaka comes forward and looks at this, they can have their own viewpoint and their own mo'olelo, their own story, their own connection to their family genealogy. 
when you look at, at this. It's not just um, one person's viewpoint. That's the beauty, of, the beauty of the way it's showcased is anybody can come here and see something that they'll be tied into or a part of that expertise that they can bring, which connects the aha. Everybody can bring an alo to this and they'll be connected into the aha, which is the whole concept of that prophecy that was shared. As an artist, myself, uh, some of the challenge was to express both the abstract and the realism in one painting, which is actually part of the culture. And I would say the abstract, the spiritual, and the reality, uh, all in one painting. And that's what Timmy expressed in, uh, you know, when he was kind of teaching me. And uh, to put that in one painting was really a challenge. But I felt that I, it took me all my life as an artist to be able to express that. This show, Reaching Out, not only met Joelle's conception, but exceeded our expectations. It reached out to the entire island and left us with a sense of hope.